the topic of black bodies is a bit of a review actually from the core, if you remember that. We're learning about black bodies and how they are perfect emitters or absorbers of radiation. And we actually say then that the sun, this is what we often say actually, that the sun itself or stars themselves, those are gonna be black bodies. So stars are also gonna be black bodies. So we're gonna say that a star then is gonna be a complete or a perfect absorber or emitter of radiation. Now, why do we care? What does that mean? It means we can use some of our understanding about black bodies in order to um, get an idea about what happens with stars. So remember that the hotter something is, the different its color appears. For example, I love this one, it burns, it looks like it's screaming here. But uh, if you look at a stove, for example, like an old school stove with the element like this, as it gets hot, of course it's red hot. You would think, oh, well red is super hot, right? Uh, well, yeah, it's hot, don't touch it for sure. But what we do is we characterize stars based on their color. Not quite the color, but kind of. So the color of a star, it tells us about the temperature of a star, kind of. And we're going to see in more detail how exactly we do this. It's not exactly the color. It's going to be the peak wavelength or the wavelength where the peak intensity happens. But So basically, red means it's hot, yes, but we have hotter things than red. Look, for example, at a candle flame. If you look at it, uh, obviously the very bottom should be the hottest. And notice that it looks kind of bluish. Blue is actually the hottest. Can you see then it's sort of a different colors of yellow and sort of then red? So do you notice that red is actually a little bit cooler? And the blue over here, that's hotter. So you can kind of notice that the different colors are going to tell you something about the temperature. So if we go a little bit further on, then we have a real equation for it. It's called Wien's Displacement Law. And this is in your um, data booklet under astrophysics. So it says lambda max times t equals 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 meter. And k is Kelvin. So what we do is we're, we're going to have this. I'm going to define it first with a picture, then I'll define the variables, I think. If we look at the intensity of the light versus the wavelength of the light, depending on what you're looking at, you're going to get different um, shapes or curves of these things. So let's just say I make something sort of bluish. So it's going to look, I mean, this is the kind of thing you're supposed to know how to sketch. So I'm going to show you first how to sketch it. So let's just say I did something that looks like this. Can you see that this thing right here then will have a wavelength that corresponds to a peak intensity. Can you see that right there? Like this is the peak intensity, there's the wavelength. We're gonna call that one lambda max. Now this right here could be something that's sort of hot. So I also drew it kind of bluish. Do you notice that so the peak is up here and the wavelength is somewhere here? Let's compare that to something that's cooler. Maybe I'll make it sort of redder. So something redder is gonna be something like, it's gonna have the same sort of shape, except there's gonna be a difference. Do you notice? The peak, first of all, this is gonna be cooler. So it's still gonna have a peak, right? But the peak is gonna be somewhere different. This time the lambda max is a larger wavelength, right? And larger wavelengths are sort of redder. If you remember your wavelengths like this right here, remember red? That could be something like 600 nanometers. Remember 10 to the minus nine. Whereas blue things, uh, those could be, for example, uh, I don't know, I mean, it depends how blue you wanna make it. But blue could be somewhere around like 488, something like that. So let's just say 480 nanometers. So we have different colors in the middle here. So do you notice what happened then? As you get cooler, do you notice the intensity goes down, but also the peak wavelength changes. So this is where this equation comes in, because this equation tells you this. If you can know the peak wavelength, so the wavelength where the peak intensity happens, you can then define a temperature for it. So we're going to do this, for example, for a black body like a stove element. You could say, ah, what is its peak element, uh, peak wavelength? And whatever that wavelength is, we're going to have that correspond to what its actual temperature would be in the lab. So which means if we heated up this piece of metal to whatever temperature, that would be its temperature. So here we're going to call lambda max is going to be the wavelength of the maximum intensity. And wavelength, of course, is measured in meters, so that's okay. T is going to be the effective temperature or the surface temperature. And T uh, is going to be measured in Kelvin. What do we mean by effective or surface temperature? Well, it depends. If it's a black body, we could say it's the actual temperature of that body. If it's a star, it's not so simple. Think about the center of a star is at a very different temperature than the outside part, like let's say like the chromosphere or something. So they could be very, very different temperatures.
So we're going to say, forget about all that. Let's just look at what color is it, so to speak. In other words, where does its maximum wavelength lie? We're going to say, great, that corresponds to a black body temperature of whatever degrees Kelvin. We're going to say, great, that's the temperature of the star. So it's not the actual temperature, keep in mind. We can call it the surface temperature, or we can call it the effective temperature. Some people call it the black body temperature. Uh, to show you a nicer curve, this is like some of the real things. This is still the intensity. It's just got weird units, but it's still the idea here is the same. This is still wavelength. So can you see here, this is what we call visible here. And this would be something that's very, very hot. Let's say, uh, and its peak would be at uh, 483 nanometers. And look what happens then as you get hotter. So this would be a temperature of 600 Kelvin. Let's just say that would be this one. Whereas something that's a lot cooler, like uh, this curve right here, this dotted line right here, that is a temperature of 5,000 Kelvin. And can you see what happened? Its intensity went down, but its wavelength went a little bit to the right. And that's where we use this same equation here in millikelvins. Remember, it's 10 to the minus 3 kelvins. Uh, so that's something pretty important. We have another one called the Stefan Boltzmann's Law. Uh, I like this picture, by the way. This is what always happens with like constellations. Doesn't it seem there's a case that like one or two stars and they're like, uh, that makes up the, you know, the crusade. It's like this whole big thing just from two stupid stars. Uh, there's an extreme example of that if you know their constellations, uh, what is it called? Canis Minor, like the small dog. It's just two effing stars. It's two stars. And it's supposed to be a small dog, like a stick maybe. Come on. So we have an equation here that defines luminosity. Remember, that's luminosity of a star here. So that's measured in watts. We have a constant here. That's why it's called Stefan Boltzmann's law. It's a Stefan Boltzmann constant. I guess there should be a dash here. Usually there's a dash. And that's a number you can look up. The way I kind of remember it, I kind of have it memorized because to me it goes like 5, 6, 7, 8. Can you see that? 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. That's a constant. You can look it up. It's on your data booklet. Then we have, a, we'll skip a one here. We'll go T, the surface temperature of a star. That's in Kelvin. And then we have a surface area of a sphere. That's what this A is. So this A is important. Again, you can look it up. The surface area of a sphere, it's on your new data booklet. Remember, there was an older version of the data booklet that didn't give you this. You had to memorize it. Now in the updated version, you get this. So it's 4 pi r squared. That's what it is. 4 times pi times radius squared. So that has to do with the radius of the star itself. This can tell you the size of the star. Um, and what would that be measured in, do you think? Well, see, this is in meters. So this is probably meters squared. So these are the different units we would be using. And I think right away then we can jump uh, to looking at this right here, the sort of an overview. Um, we can see colors and sizes of stars. It turns out the colors of them, remember, so the color tells you something about the temperature. Right? So this one is bluer looking star. This would be a redder looking star. So this is a, a nice thing right here that actually shows you a rough comparison of the comparative sizes of stars and their colors. So do you notice this? Now, don't care too much about these spectral classes. You used to have to know these like O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Normally they were done in that order. They were done like O was the first one. Uh, there used to be a trick to remember like, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. That was like the sexist sort of mnemonic we used to use. But I remember my very first school where I taught it was an all-girls school. And I remember telling the girls, oh, look, this has been a sexist field for a long time. Let's come up with something better. So for their homework, they had to come up with a better mnemonic. And one of the girls came up with something I'll never forget. It's awesome. She said, oh, be a feminist, go kill men. Okay, maybe it's sort of a sexist on the other extreme, but there you go. Um, Either way, you don't have to worry about the spectral classes for IB uh, astrophysics. What you need to have a rough idea of, though, is the colors. So these are here what we call red dwarves. These are like these big, super giant, bluish-looking stars. And this is a, this is actually a, a try to show the real colors, what they actually appear like. On diagrams, they'll show them super blue-looking. But in real life, they actually look something closer to this. This was an attempt to make them look like what they really look like. And if you know your constellations, there's this one right here. Uh, this is from uh, Orion. Orion is that constellation, remember, that has these ones right here, like this right here, like a three dots like this right here. So it looks kind of like a dude, right, with his bow. Um, this one right here, that's Betelgeuse. That's a star. It's uh, got an Arabic root, so I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I mean the Arabic uh, name at least supposed to be like this. It's a red super giant. What does that mean? It means it's huge. Uh, it's so big, in fact, if you were to replace it with our sun, it would actually uh, be about, uh, roughly almost the way out to Jupiter. So we'd be in it. So that would be bad. Uh, we're expecting it to go supernova any minute now. I want to say any minute. I mean, plus or minus a few, you know, 100 
or thousand or million years but you know we're not that good uh, but we're expecting it to go supernova and it's in our own galaxy which is awesome so it means if this thing blows up it's going to be awesome and don't worry we're not in any danger but actually this is a really cool fairly recent picture that was taken of uh, Betelgeuse really really high precision uh, picture taken at ALMA um, ALMA is the Atacama large millimeter array it's this really cool array of telescopes located in, um, in the Atacama desert in South America it's actually located at an altitude of 5,000 meters so like people need oxygen in order to sort of breathe up there so they have to bring their O2 tanks um, but they took this image of it and look it's actually it's actually got a weird bulge there which is kind of interesting so there's some sort of asymmetry going on so just to give an idea this is a red star it's a red supergiant so now let's do an example let's take a look at an example of two different stars being investigated uh they're a and b but actually i thought i mean they're they're real stars they're actually two stars remember from this constellation we were looking at before uh, at least in another video i was looking at it it's constellation orion Remember, it's supposed to be the one right here with the hunter right here with the dude right here with the uh, bow. So in that constellation, there are two nice bright stars. Instead of Betelgeuse that we just looked at, let's do Bellatrix and Alnilum. So Bellatrix is uh, this really hot blue star um, that's on that top shoulder and then we have Alnilum which is the middle star of the belt here so that's A and B so I actually looked up some of the real facts from it so this is the following that's known about them we have uh, LA so Alnilum it's got a luminosity of 275,000 times the luminosity of the sun and then we have the radius of it is 24 times the radius of the sun and we know that its surface temperature or its effective temperature its black body temperature is 27 thousand kelvin so this is going to be a really really hot hot blue star here um now we've got lb so bellatrix we have 64,006, and we don't know b now if we look at this different equations here the main equation that would drive this is this right l equals sigma a t to the fourth maybe we'll write that down here so that's the equation that drives this okay l equals sigma a t to the fourth don't forget that what this a contains right this a is actually a 4 pi r squared t fourth so if we were going to do this for star b right we're looking for b's surface temperature we want to know what is the surface temperature of bellatrix right we know it for alnilum we know it we're given that um, we want to know what is this had they given us the luminosity of the sun and the radius of the sun this would have been easy do you see that? I would have just said, all right, then for B, I would just say, I would put that in, I would put in this, and I'd put in this. And I'd be done. It would be really easy, wouldn't it? So this is an example of a, a pretty hard um, IB exam question. So this here is one of those where it helps to use another tool. And this is the tool you very often have to use. I tell my students, on average, you have to do this usually once, maybe even twice in a paper three. So in an exam like this, uh, you have to do this especially for astrophysics at least it's certainly the case so let's look at this here here we're stuck you think well, well i don't know what the luminosity of the sun is i don't know that by heart you don't have to know it this is why you can use what's called a ratio so if we use a ratio equation we could really make an equation right we can make an equation that goes like this l a we could say we could write an equation for a we could do the same thing right sigma instead of putting in the a let's just put in right away the four pi remember because that is the same as that so let's just skip the surface area part and put in the 4 pi r so we have 4 times pi times r a squared here i used a lowercase here it's uppercase i may as well just use what they used here uh times t a to the fourth and what you can do then you can divide a whole equation by another whole equation so to see here i would just i first wrote down the equation that governs this behavior and then i actually go about and actually fill in the values so here for b everything we just have a subscript b for and that's it all right so now i just start uh, seeing if anything is simpler do you notice the sigmas cancel out the fours cancel out the pi's cancel out that's nice now let's actually sort of zoom into this la here it's actually 275,000 l sun over lb which is 6400 l sun and all that will equal, let's see now, what's RA? RA is 24 times R sun over RB, which is 6R sun. 
And maybe you've noticed I've made a mistake. I've done it on purpose because lots of people forget this. It's really important. If you're going to take this whole thing, you have to remember to square it here, okay? You have to square all that. Then we have TA, which is 27,000 to the fourth divided by TB, which is what we want to the power of four. Now, if we're going to make this, this at least becomes simpler. Those canceled out. And if you think about it, then I can rewrite this. I want to show you something here what you can do. You can actually rewrite it like this. Uh, first of all, let's see if we can simplify things here. Do you see this? Uh, I can take out at least two zeros here. That's at least easier, isn't it? So now I have uh, 2750 over 64. That's a little bit nicer. Equals, keep in mind, it's got to be 24 squared r0 or r sun squared. Remember, it's a 24 is also squared. A lot of people forget that. That's the really important part here. And we have 6 squared r zero squared and good news those cancel out and then have this big number here now this helps maybe just do it all on your calculator um, let's see what we can do here um, to get tb by itself you'd have to put the tb over on the left side so i could say tb to the power of four that'll be let's see it's going to be 24 squared over well six squared is 36 so that i know uh what's 24 squared actually let's go a little bit further let's at least simplify things slightly here so 24 squared i don't know that off the top of my head uh 24 squared that's 576 over 36 is that anything nice at least Oh yeah, good, that's gonna be 16. So we're gonna rewrite that here, TB fourth. That's just gonna just be a number 16 here. What else do we have? We had, um, let's say we had this 27,000 to the power of four, but if I wanted to multiply this TB to the power of four over on the left side like I did here, I have to get rid of this. So this actually gets sort of flipped and put to the other side. Again, if you're not sure, just really take your time with this. This is just one of those really gross ones now. There's just lots of really gross numbers here, right? So we have this number right here to the fourth times this 64 over 2750. Let's actually do that on my calculator here. So 2750, all that times 27,000. Oops, I got to put brackets around it. That's always important. So I'm just going to do this on my own calculator here. I get some number times 16. I get some big number. I get like 1.98 times 10 to the 17 is what I get. And I get something huge like that. And I get like 1.98 times 10 to the 17. That's not the temperature though. Remember, that's the temperature to the fourth. How do I actually find TB? To do TB, what I do is I take this whole answer right here, this sort of 1.98 times 10 to the 17. I put that to the power of one over four because that's how you undo a uh, power of four. Remember, like you're going to do a square by doing square root. I end up with an answer of 21,091 Kelvin. And if I'm going to do it to two, let's see, yeah, two significant figures, then I can say that's pretty much that the temperature of Bellatrix is 21,000 Kelvin. So it's another pretty big star, isn't it? This is a very big, very blue sort of star. This is how you can solve what I would consider a fairly difficult question here. This isn't trivial. Remember, had they given you the luminosity of the sun and the radius of the sun, it would have been much easier. But without it, you had to use this ratio idea, this idea of having one equation divided by another one. And I tried to find one of the hardest types of questions I could find on exams that uses this. Because I figure if you train with hard questions, then the exam will seem easier for you. I hope that helps.